She has done that herself. That's the value of this entire technique. Our third case is chronic laminitis with osteomyelitis. Notice this mare has a very uh, stilty gait behind. She's loading very heavily. She shod with a pair of my four-point rail shoes, and the farrier done a tremendous job putting them on. She still needs just a little mechanical advantage, which we're going to point out. If you notice, she has the, the nails are well back. She's actually nailed to the back, but she's still being in pains in front. Notice how we need a parallel line between the top of the shoe and the bottom of P3. Only slight differences are going to make a big difference with this mare. We're taking a look at the, the overgrowth at the front. No problem. You can let the foot hang over all you like, so long as you don't pin the shoe to the foot in the front. The rasp is sitting in exactly the plane I want the shoe to sit. We must use the posterior part of the foot and unload the front. This mare has been draining out both soles due to penetration for several months. She's had many, many abscesses, and she has never really been quite happy. We're going to back the toe off in the same fashion, not invading the sole as, as it lies over P3. It's quite important to back the heels up, basically to the wise part of the frog. This is the derotation process. As you can see, she has penetrated both soles. We're going to open the sole from the wall side. You must be very careful as you do this, otherwise you're going to have a lot of sole corium protruding through the sole. There's no reason to ever have corium at the bottom of the foot. If you'll open your sole from the front edge, I'm actually, notice the exudate. We have a, an area right there we want to be extremely careful because if you reach in just a little bit deeper and grab sole corium, then you're going to have proud flesh or granulation tissue. I want to unload this area and give it a, a healing environment for the next three to six months. The shoe is actually set on in the same plane we set the last case. We're going to be parallel now to the bottom of P3. Notice I can actually see under the shoe. I'm unloading the front and loading only the heel. This is so important and it's such a tough area to, to actually teach. I will apply the advanced cushion being very careful not to let it run forward because I do not want the advanced cushion to be sitting over this area. I'll paste a little gauze in just to, to make sure that the cushion does not migrate too far forward. Fold the screen back, place the shoe on, anchor the shoe. I'll let the cushion go slightly underneath. Now if you'll notice the wide web of the shoe that I pulled forward, the toe that I pulled forward, <clears throat> is going to act as a hospital plate. It's going to mechanically be setting directly over the apex. This is the advantage of using this particular shoe. You do not need to use a hospital plate when you have penetration. The shoe must be pulled back sufficient so that the web of the shoe is actually sitting directly over P3. This is very misleading. Notice I'll pull the shoe off and just show you exactly how the, the shoe is setting in relationship to the rest of the foot. These nails must be driven <clears throat> much further back into the heel than you would commonly like to, uh, to put a shoe on. Once again, we're anchoring the shoe to the heel of the foot so we can utilize the heel for support and relieve the, the, the loading zone in, in an area forward of the apex. With a horse that has a very long toe with chronic rotation, it's quite often to see three inches of toe forward of the shoe once you've placed it on. Notice the lines we've drawn here. We want those lines to be parallel with our application. This will unload the apex, as you see here. Slight differences will make a tremendous difference for the healing process. Once you've got the first foot shod, I will position the horse so that they can stand directly over the foot. Now, they don't want to do that. The pinch the little chest in there. You notice how I did that? It will help you to pick up most all laminated animals. Once again, the shoe goes on. I'll lay the rasp in the heel. The frog has already been trimmed. There's your guideline. That is your derotation trim. I'll have to trim from that point back. If you allow your rasp to move forward of the apex of the frog, you will invariably be impinging the sole, and you're loading the sole in an area that is very sensitive. You'll have to treat several uh, complicated laminated case in this fashion before you become comfortable with a derotation process. The 
Once again, we've got the advanced cushion mix. We're going to apply it over the heel only. Apply the screen, being careful not to let it run too far forward. Anchor the shoe, push it down quite hard. Push the advanced cushion slightly under the lip of the shoe. If you notice, I'm using the same shoe that this mare came in with. I'm just setting it in a different position. You can actually feel underneath, raise that up, trim your screen off. There's the draining abscess. We do not want to cover that area up. We'd like to be able to treat that. The shoe, once again, is acting as a hospital plate because it's directly beneath the toe of the shoe. Now, when you're driving into the heel area, you've got to be very careful, of course, because you don't have a lot of wall. This particular nail didn't grab anything of any substance. Instead of clenching it over or pulling it over and destroying that part of the foot, simply pull it and go back to the next hole. Now, you have to become... Uh, experience to become comfortable back here, but there's actually plenty of wall. If you pitch your nail holes both inside and out, then you, you have the liberty to, to find a place that you can nail with very low risk. It's uh, very seldom that I will ever get a horse uh, to, uh, in a uh, quicker horse in this particular area. As you finish the toe off, I'm not trying to make it look as if this Mary did not have laminitis. I simply want to remove a little excess toe so she does not use that as a lever. If you notice the gap between the shoe and the, and the foot, this allows me to treat the penetration from the front using the shoe as a hospital plate. To take this wall off completely from the front to make it look as if she did not have laminitis actually weakens the hoof capsule. It's a lot of work for nothing and it's very detrimental. It's very important not to forget the hind feet on laminated camels. I see a lot of them that get an excessively long toe. It's very hard on their back as they're carrying a lot of weight behind. So keep these toes knocked off. Reduce the breakover. This is a cross-legged trim that I, I use almost routinely on all my horses behind. It, it, most horses are very, very comfortable to cross them over like this. It gives me the ability to set into the horse that can push against me. Uh, some people think it's very dangerous. But once you have actually tried it a few times, uh, you'll, you'll like it. This is a four-point technique. I'm just going to back off the, the break over the toe. Once again, I'm not going to invade the sole over P3. This is a big misconception with my technique. A lot of people want to put the conventional trim on, and then they want to apply the four-point. I go straight to the four-point. I do not remove excess foot before I apply the break over over the toe as well as the heel, uh, the quarter area. I round the edges of the horn so that the, the ground cannot actually feel an abrasive surface. And you'll find five to six weeks, weeks later, you've still got a nice, round, cosmetically acceptable hoof with actually very dense horn. The four-point trim allows me a technique that I can allow the foot to actually sculpture itself and produce as much horn mass on the load surface as possible. Also gives me the ability to keep a very cosmetically acceptable hoof on all breeds, regardless of what they're doing uh, performance-wise. This technique has been misunderstood by many people. On the other hand, uh, I have professionals as well as amateur farriers. When I say amateur farriers, I'm speaking of uh, young farriers that are just into the business. They're using this technique with great success. It's a self-maintaining type trim, and if you notice, it has very subtle differences from a conventional trim. This is old Kokomo. She's watched me uh, treat probably 1,500 laminated cases. She's keeping an eye on everything today. We're going to go into the red technique for the deep flexor tenotomy. This may require deep flexor tenotomy in order to gain optimum effect from the derotation process. The tenotomy is... Uh, Quite easy to perform on the standing horse. Here I'm just doing a little light ring block above, do it as high as possible. What's important to note here is it, without the proper derotation and the placement of the shoe, the tenotomy is a waste of time. I see many, many cases every year where they've had a tenotomy and the derotation process has not been accomplished prior to surgery. Your results are very short-lived and you will find that Contractors and, and complications will always follow if you perform the, the deep flexor tenotomy without properly shoeing the animal. I can't stress this enough. The shoeing process is 90% of results that you want to get from this particular surgical procedure. 
Once I've blocked, I will place the uh, foot in my uh, regular red ultimate, which had three wedges. I'll just tape it on. This allows me to get my retractors between the deep and the superficial flexors because this amount of elevation will make the deep flexor very, very lax. You have actually no tension whatsoever on the deep flexor. My retractors are made from uh, stainless steel table knives. You can pick them up at any uh, discount store. Make sure they're of good quality and of one piece. You simply grind them down. You shape the ends over a one-inch pipe. You do not heat these. I shape them cold. They're kind of springy, so you have to kind of warm them with a the hammer, so to speak. Your farriers, you can make these things up for your veterinarian quite easy. You grind the edges down, polish them on a buffing wheel of some type, so they're tissue tolerable, and they become very, very helpful for this particular technique. This technique, you make an incision right along the junction of the superficial and the deep, usually right below the anastomotic branch. You use a pair of medicine bombs that go in just to bluntly dissect between the superficial and deep. I'll also run them just on the interface of the deep. This pushes the nerve forward. I will actually leave my, my medicine bombs in place as I slide my first retractor in. Very important to break up any adhesions that might be in this area. It makes the procedure go so much smoother. Leave it in place. Slide the, the one with the heavy curve to the inside. You take the other one, which has a little less radius, and you go between the superficial and the deep. Without that wedge on, you could not get these retractors between those two because the deep would be very tight. If you notice how my assistant's hand is actually raised up a bit too high, I'm going to have to bring it back down. But if you allow that hand to go too high, you'll slip off and you can cut the vessels behind. So keep them in line. They're hooked together. Notice the ends of the deep flexor. The wedge is still on. I'm going to have my assistant to slip that, the ultimate off, and I want you to watch what happens to the ends of the deep flexor. Now, the lower end has dropped down approximately an inch and a half. This will show you clearly the effects of using the ultimates to reduce the, the strain of the deep flexor in acute laminitis. And I usually just put in a mattress suture sometime, one stitch is all you need. It's quite an easy technique. It's very straightforward and it's very low risk. I use a uh, combine bandage. I like to keep my legs bandaged for approximately three months. I will change the first set of bandages in seven to ten days, remove the stitches. I want to use adequate cotton and put on a very firm vet wrap support. <clears throat> Using this technique, it's it's routine for my legs to be cosmetically acceptable. Seldom ever will you be able to look at the uh, legs post-op and tell that they have editonotomy. If you use 4-inch uh, elasticon at the top, take the stretch out, lay it around. You can get two to three weeks out of, of a bandage change and no problem. The other leg, I will do both legs at the same time. There's no reason to do one, wait a week or so, or do the other one. There's... Uh, I can't stress how low risk this procedure has been for me. We've actually uh, performed hundreds of uh, deep flexor tenotomies following the derotation process with very good results. The toes are packed off with betadine. If it's, uh, the horse is very, very sensitive, sometimes I put a little DMSO actually in the betadine for a few days. You can medicate all penetrations to the front of the shoe using the shoe as a hospital plate. Note this mare stance uh, immediately after surgery. The ankles have not dropped. The toes are not hyperextended. Notice her walking here. She's still blocked, of course. But note the hind limbs. She's moving very freely. Let's review the derotation process. Note the angles that are forming with the, with the shoe versus the load surface of P3. This is the most critical aspect of the entire process. Those lines must be close to parallel in order to unload the apex and load the heel. This is a radiograph following the proper derotation. I want to point out several areas. The line between the base of P3 and the top of the shoe is parallel. We have a, approximately a 6 degree wedge that's applied to the shoe. This would be the rail, of course. This will allow me to not overload the heel during the healing process. The breakover, if you notice, is directly beneath the apex of P3. This is quite important as well, as it prevents us from bending the tubules, the lamina, through the healing process. 
allows the entire half of the hoof capsule to be free floating and unloaded during the next three to four months. The nails also, if you'll note, are well behind the widest point of the, of the foot. If these nails do not befall, fall behind the widest point, then you have invariably pulled the shoe back to the toe of the foot. These are points that I want you to review over and over until you're very comfortable because it's these basic aspects of this formula that makes this procedure offer you consistent, successful results. Note the next frame. Our goal has been to grow massive amounts of soul. There's basically one and one only goal for all my laminated cases. If I can get them to generate massive soul in a short period of time, you can be successful with almost 100% of them. If they fail to grow soul, after you have relieved the tendon pull, compression against the inner sole corium, and all aspects of breakover that are interfering with the loading zone, then invariably you have an animal that has suppressed or has irreversible damage to the circulatory system. Using this process, it's very normal for me to double thickness of sole every 15 to 30 days throughout the entire healing process. This is approximately three months later. Note the amount of soul that this mare has generated over such a short period of time. As we all know, laminitis can be a very catastrophic event, but it doesn't have to have catastrophic results. Using this step-by-step -step methodical approach to treating laminitis will help you to improve your success.